p.m. Thursday, May 6, 2021, Hillsborough County Community Action Board Executive Meeting is called to order. This meeting is a hybrid meeting and all contents are being recorded. So roll call, if you, I'll call out your name and if you can just acknowledge that you're here, I'll go based on what I see on the screen. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, Joey Henderson. Present. Ms. Noreen Copeland-Miller. Here. Mr. William Thomas. Here. Ms. Sharon Gordon. Here. Ms. Audrey Ziegler. I'm here. Maria Gillis. I'm here. Mr. Sergey Ivan. Uh, Rosa, uh, Sergey is um, an employee that a temporary employee that will be helping okay. out the fiscal section. Um, I don't I don't mean to speak for him, but just so you um, okay. weren't wondering who he was. Um, so I've invited him to join in the meeting. He'll be assisting me and I'm going to be teaching him everything I know. Okay, wonderful. I think I've heard his name. I heard you make that comment before. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, Mr. Guida, Derek Guida. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so did I miss anyone? Okay, if not, moving right along. Uh, invocation. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, would you uh, do us the honor, please? Certainly. You bow your heads and join me. Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for bringing us together this day and this very moment to be able to discuss those who are in greatest of needs. Thank you for the staff that works diligently in trying to do all that they can to serve these individuals. Bless this meeting and bless those who are on their way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, sir. So the Pledge of Allegiance, if we are in a position, uh, I don't want to force everybody to stand, but if we would just acknowledge by putting our hands over our hearts and uh, reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States, of, the United States of America, to the Republic for which we stand, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, moving right along to the mission statement. Uh, Ms. Copeland-Miller, do you have access to the mission statement? I don't have it in front of me, I'm sorry. Okay, so I have it. I will actually go ahead and read the mission statement. The Hillsborough County Community Action Board partners with community stakeholders to stabilize and empower vulnerable individuals and families to achieve self-sufficiency through advocacy and essential services. So we have three executive members on the call. So we need to, we are at, at um, we do have enough to proceed with the quorum, right? And approve the minutes to approve the agenda. Um, Madam Chair, there's no quorum because this is a virtual meeting. So there's no okay. Mm -hmm. My bad. I'm sorry. So, um, we cannot approve the agenda. Madam Chair, this is William Thomas. Yes. Uh, what I would recommend, we just get a consensus from the those in attendance, uh, executive committee members in attendance that uh, we are have no objection to the agenda and then have it ratified at the next meeting. So we have it for the record. Madam Chair, this is Noreen. I, for the executive committee, from my understanding, we do have a, a quorum that's needed for the executive committee. And I think it only needs to be three of us here and we have four. But we are virtual and not hybrid. That was, that was. Um, oh, okay prevented us from moving forward. And it was my, uh, it was my decision to do virtual, so. Okay, thank you, I'm sorry. Thank you. 
So we can do standing committee reports, just know that we can't um, vote on anything. We can just do updates and it's my understanding from staff that we didn't have any major topics um, that needed to be discussed or decided upon. That was the grounds of going virtual versus doing a hybrid meeting. Okay. So for the executive committee meeting, uh, myself as the chair, we met on Thursday, March 25th, 2021. Uh, and we discussed uh, topics around putting some uh, items in place as far as um, canceling meetings, uh, what that protocol would look like, and discussion around hybrid versus um, uh, uh, virtual meetings and what is required as far as a quorum and um, how we would move forward in both of those events. If we had a quorum, if we did not have a quorum, the time frame when staff would be notified and this time frame staff would notify board members of whether the meeting would take place or not. So that was the primary discussion um, besides board attend um, uh, uh, board members attendance. So I do have a question around that. Uh, well, that's item F, so I'll wait. Okay, so that's it for me. Does anybody have any questions or comments of, about what we discussed um, in our last executive meeting? I know staff was preparing something for us and it's probably going out in the board packet or it did go out in the last board packet. Right? Yes, I'm preparing. I'm sorry, Ms. Hill, preparing the. Um, could, could you recall what went out in the board packet? I'm sorry. No, I just was asking about the um, the policy that we're going to put in place as far as uh, having a quorum, uh, attending meetings, and when we have meetings, if we have to cancel a meeting, what that protocol would look like. And as well as if um, the chair or the person, or the chair is not in place, moving to the next um, person of chain of command and what that would look like. Yeah, that was actually, yes, that was in the board packet from the last meeting. You are correct. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. So with that, I see we have a new, another board member on the line. If you could introduce yourself for the record. Uh, yes, this is uh, Jennifer Anderson, um, Planning Evaluation Committee Chair. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. So, moving right along, uh, Bylaws Committee, Mr. Madam Vice Chair. Chair. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Madam Chair. This is there. Would you, could I ask a quick question? Sure. Um, I want to go back to some of the discussion that you just had about board attendance and hybrid and virtual uh, forum. I'm sorry, uh, in person forum. So, I was hoping at the meeting next Wednesday, and as you know, I let you know yesterday that I won't be at the overall, the big, you know, uh, community action board meeting next week. But one of the things I wanted to talk to the board about, and Ms. Gillis and I have been talking a little bit, is engaging with our board members and finding out what would help people be more comfortable in coming into a, an in-person meeting. You know, does it look a little bit like maybe hosting a meeting outdoors where we can socially distance a little bit more and not have to worry so much about um, you know, being in close proximity, of course, that represents challenges because we wouldn't have necessarily HTV present. So it eliminates some of the hybrid um, participation with people being able to be, you know, on on this platform versus being in person. But we were just kind of getting together and brainstorming what options we have and what the board is willing to help us come up with so that we could get our board business voted on. So if you could champion that discussion or allow Ms. Gillis the time with the group next Wednesday to kind of um, poll the group and just have some open discussion about what people would be willing to do, what would make the game changer difference so that we could in, in ensure that we have an in-person quorum. That would really be a welcome discussion for us so board uh, staff could work with the board to make sure we get the votes you need. Um, you know, we looked at what options we have with the resolution to make votes outside of the community action board and 
we didn't want to take that conversation into too too far of a direction because we want the integrity of what this board does for us to stay in place. So at this point, we want to work with our board members and make sure that the board has the opportunity to vote and not look at what options we may have outside of that. So I'll, I'll use that kind of as my teaser to make sure that we have a, a robust discussion and make sure people are heard and we can make those changes as much as possible to help people be in person. So just know we're willing to do whatever it takes to get the in-person vote and not look at other options because I, I think that takes away from all of the interest of this board and what you all are here to serve and to do. Okay, so that that is fine. I think Ms. Gillis um, uh, um, can take on that task of having that discussion with the board members at the next meeting. But I do want to just let you guys know at the county, you guys have the best setup that I've seen. Um, as far as going into places and having your individual booths, um, you know, I have not seen that at any of the other meetings that I've been to, and I and I heard another board member um, say it. They had not seen it. Uh, they made a comment when they were there. They had not seen it at any of the other facilities. They have been it. I actually brought it back here to my group and said, you know, I'm in my own box when I go over there. <laughs> You know, I don't have to worry about, you know, being, you know, close to anybody. So I really appreciate what you guys have done over at the uh, at your building to keep everybody safe. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think it's worth re reiterating from some of the people that have been in person and can talk a little bit about your comfort level. I also think it's worth mentioning too. a lot of people are working hybrid. So maybe there's an inconvenience with the time that they're finishing up, wrapping up on hybrid meeting for work and then having to get in their car and make it to a destination. So perhaps we look at a different time, you know, whatever it takes to get our board business done. If you all think we can get a quorum, an in-person quorum first thing in the morning to get the vote, you know, I would say everything's on the table and let the board's voice be heard because the recommendations we make may not be the ones that will work best for the majority. And, and obviously the goal at this point would be to get 12 people in a room so we can get the board business done. Even if we were to be able to uh, ensure that every other month, I think that's still it's not ideal, but it still helps us get all get to where we need to be. So, whatever that looks like indoors, outdoors, early, midday, late, I mean, whatever we think will work for the majority. And of course, I don't want to turn everything on its head and have mayhem, but if we could ensure getting a forum more often than not, that would certainly avoid some of these meetings where you all have to have great discussion and then you have to have the discussion all over again to try to entice people to come in to get the vote. So again, anything that um, anything that we can do, we're willing to explore with our you know, county partners, internal partners to make it happen. But this board is very important to us, as I mentioned at the BOCC meeting yesterday, and we can't do our business without you all. And we certainly don't want to inconvenience you, but we need you. So let us know the best way to do that. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you so much. Ms. Anderson, your hand is up. Uh, yeah, I, I I totally agree with Ms. Uh, Ziegler and that it may be a, a point of, you know, the, the we have a new normal now. Um, and so, you know, looking into other possibilities of when people are available and where all that's changed. And so I think the we have to create what the new normal is for the cat board. So I totally agree with her. We need to go to the board and find out, hey, what's going to get you there? I wasn't there last week and. I mean, last month, Madam Chair, you know, uh, you know, I had some allergy. It was allergy issues, but they would never let me in the front door because they're, you know, do you do this, 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 and uh, you ensure and thankfully saved me the trip. Um, I wasn't feeling that well that day, and uh, my staff is being COVID tested every week now, so I know we're not because um, you know, we do deal a lot with the public, and so um, so we're blessed to be able to do that, but not everybody can. And so I think that that that's an awesome, awesome idea that Ms. Ziegler has, and that's just to talk to the board. Or maybe if I can throw another idea out there, um, instead of so much of a discussion that could turn into, like Ms. Ziegler said, turn into kind of like a free for all, maybe send out, uh, have something sent out to kind of get a little feedback, some kind of a poll, something. I don't know. You guys are really great at those doodle polls and that kind of thing and kind of get uh, something uh, back, some kind of feedback in writing to give a base to start that discussion from versus just bring it up and it turn into a free for all. 
maybe. So that was it. That's all I had. Yeah, I had to find, I had to find the mute button. You know, the mute button hides from you, I think. <laughs> Can you find the mute button when you need it? <laughs> I think that's a great idea, Ms. Anderson. So, um, and Ms. Ziegler, uh, because we definitely want all the board members. I'm, I'm in a position now where I can do do uh, virtual or hybrid, you know, and um, even though my schedule's gonna get really, really busy, um, I'm flexible because I do want to, you know, play my part and, and be a part of whatever decisions are being made. So, um, uh, Ms. Gillis, um, I'll allow you to champion this at our next meeting. And if you guys decide in the meantime that you want to come up with a survey monkey or something of that sort, uh, then I welcome that. Uh, whatever works best for the staff to get everybody, um, everybody involved within a timely fashion, because we definitely don't want the board meeting to become a long discussion about how we should have the meeting when we're at the meeting. So um, our anything uh, we can do in advance will be greatly appreciated. Absolutely, Madam Chair. We'll get some uh, ideas down and uh, have a quick discussion with the board, and then we can come up with uh, maybe a survey that we could, can go out to all the members. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much. So if we're ready to move on to our bylaws committee, Vice Chair Mr. Henderson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, the bylaws committee did not meet. We don't have a report. However, I do want to just step back for a moment to ask, should we consider some kind of provisions in the bylaws with regards to uh, this type of uh, forum for meetings? I mean, it could come up again and uh, and it is preventing uh, staff from being able to uh, execute what they need to do. And it could become a, a serious problem when it really comes right down to the uh, to the uh, funding decisions. Should there be some type of provision uh, included in the uh, bylaws with regards to uh, making the hybrid meetings or virtual meetings? I just open that up for discussion if I may. Uh, staff, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm thinking if we have a, a, a protocol in place that's uh, a part of our public record that would suffice. I think that's what we discussed. Or do we need to add it to the bylaws? Well, we have the attendance requirement or expectations, I should say, in the uh, in the bylaws, and in, even so far as uh, with regards to um, defining what is uh, grounds for dismissal, which is basically, you know. Uh, three absences uh, without any uh, uh, three unexcused absences, um, but there's really nothing in there with regards to, um, you know, being in having the inability to vote on certain things that need to be taken care of. Okay, um, I would have to acquiesce to staff. M Madam Chair, if I may, this is Maria. Um, I would um, maybe table it for now just because we don't know i know that there's word of you know things changing and and we don't know what the next three months will bring i think if we can at least um uh, come up to uh, come up with a consensus for the next couple of meetings to ensure we have a quorum i think it's ideal and then uh maybe once we you know get our footing there maybe we can look at what the requirements are going to be moving forward but i i really do think that september is going to look very different than it looks today no, and, and I 100% agree with you. I'm, I'm hoping uh, our president is right that you know we'll all be able to go outside and celebrate Fourth of July with our hot dogs and fireworks or whatever. But I'm thinking long term. Uh, the reality is that this could happen again, uh, for whatever the case might be. It might be hurricanes that's created such devastation that, but we still need to be able to meet in some. If this is going to be the forum that we meet. Um, but so I'm thinking long term, and, and I agree with you. It's something to be tabled, but it's definitely something that we need to discuss at some point. Absolutely, I agree. So that's my report there, Madam Chair. Unless anyone else has anything else to add. Thank you. And I have to be honest, we are constantly, everybody's trying to think outside the box right now. There's no such thing as normal right now. So. 
we all have to keep our minds open to doing it a little bit differently. Uh, Mr. Thomas, Mr. William Thomas, but I'm sorry, Ms. Anderson, did you have something before I move on? Just one quick question. Is us meeting like, just for clarity, is uh, the, the board meeting personal and um, I'm looking for the word here. Virtually. Thank you. Virtually. Um, and not being able to vote unless you're in person. Is that a bylaw or is that a law law? That's not a bylaw. So in terms of virtual, you know, virtual is not even in the bylaws. Right. That's what I'm saying. So I mean, why? I guess I'm asking why is it that the board is not allowed to vote virtually? Because we have a directive from the governor and that supersedes anything. Okay, I, I didn't know that. That's why I was just looking for clarity because I know that when we were all virtual, we were make, we were voting on stuff, weren't we? Um, we were completely no. virtual. Right, when initially um, it was stated that um, virtual was the me me mechanism, but when it went to, you had to have a hybrid, then it changed. So we just go to the at the direction of the governor, uh, depending on the state of emergency that he puts out. Well, when we obviously we have to. I was just getting some clarity because I know we were voting, uh, you know, virtually, and then all of a sudden, when it went to half, well, basically half and half, that's how it turned out. Um, I was just some clarity. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to uh, apologize, uh, apologize, and of course provide an excuse. I'm like oh and two the past two finance uh, budget meetings we've had, uh, so I'm going to fall on that sword today. Uh, I will say that I did advise staff uh, several weeks ago. I'm working on a project in my job regarding the Department of Defense, so I'm trying to get that locked down. I got about three weeks. I'm in my third week, so I should be back to normal shortly uh, to do in person, but it definitely has been a distraction. Uh, but the board, uh, the finance committee did meet. I was absent. Uh, to my understanding, they did not uh, pursue any business uh, that day. Uh, that was, I believe, Tuesday. And uh, so I have nothing reported in particular, uh, but again, I, I'm definitely going to be putting some thought into making sure that business moves on. I'm always about business moving on, whether I'm there or not at the table. So I'll definitely be a little more aggressive on that at our next committee meeting. But that's all I have to report, Madam Chair. Thank you. And you're 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 not the only one where the workload is piling up <laughs> and the time is dwindling to get it done. Oh yeah. <laughs> so we're feeling we are feeling your pain. Okay. So uh, with that, we'll move on to plan evaluation, Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Yes, the struggle is real, Mr. Thomas. We, I think we are all there. Um, for the planning evaluation committee, we um, have quite a bit going on. Um, we uh, had the uh, info, uh, hmm, trying to decide where to start here. Um, the Wi-Fi and internet service um, with the uh, T-Mobile hotspots uh, is still uh, moving forward. We're waiting on a proposal from the um, Education Foundation and we've given them till uh, May 14th to get that proposal in to, for dis distribution of those hotspots. Um, and also we have uh, nine uh, proposals in all together for funding. Um, and one of those was the Hillsborough County, uh, or actually the EPIC program, which last funding year was, we, we approved it to go to the board. And the only problem was, is they had an issue with Hillsborough County Schools and um, getting all their if the paperwork with them um, back to us. And so it wasn't, uh, it was a glitch with the, with the Hillsborough County School System. It was nothing that Epic did wrong and it wasn't in time to get in last funding year. And so they're back 
again, they've done everything they're supposed to do. And so we had a lot of this, uh, quite a bit of discussion about it. And we are going to ask Madam Chair that that be uh, put on the agenda for the next CAB board meeting to consider them um, there to be funded for their 31,000 share and help me. I apologize. I don't have it in front of me. Um, you're, you're yeah, sorry, it's 31,250. $31,250 that we do uh, proceed because they, they, they've been in mothballs for a little while and, and they should honestly uh, only to be fair to uh, present that to the board for a vote at the next meeting that they do be funded. Um, so if that pleases your uh, Madam Chair that that go on the agenda for a vote at the next meeting. The other eight we had asked for uh, scoring to be done um, by the committee of which some were done um, by some uh, by a few members about three or four of the um, proposals were scored um, and then um, we had one uh, board member that scored all of them. So we went back to the drawing board and we gave the that committee uh, till 514 2021 again we that's like the that's the day to get those rubrics in to us before we meet again so that we can bring more of those proposals back to the board and uh, make any other decisions working with budget and finance with Mr. Thomas to try to um, see uh, any other changes we can make or whatever, because uh, that does take about half the funding uh, by by going ahead and funding at Epic. Um, myself and uh, Ms. Gindelsberger, which are on that committee, have recused ourselves from not only scoring, but voting on any proposals. We found it would be prudent because her being from feeding Tampa Bay and myself being associated with two of the um, um, different organizations that have proposals. Um, we found it would be better and wouldn't skew the scores uh, by us just not voting on one or just not voting on two. Uh, it was decided that Ms. Gindelsberger and I would be removed completely. So it will be seven of, I believe the nine members of the committee will be voting. So it'll be a nice, um, accurate score for the proposals. There wouldn't be any scoring missing, uh, just to keep you up with, to date with that, Madam Chair, that Ms. Gindelsberger and I both agreed that that would be the most prudent thing to do. And there wouldn't be any, uh, no one could ever come back with any kind of uh, um, thought of impropriety on our parts, because I, I don't do gray area and I don't believe Ms. Gindelsberger too. Because even though we aren't, like she said, I work for Feeding Tampa Bay, but I don't have anything to do with Fresh Force. But somebody could come back. You, you get what I'm saying. Yeah, people are. And I'm the same way in, in, with the two agencies that I would feel uncomfortable being part of scoring or voting on either one of those. Um, so the proposals have till the 14th, excuse me, <clears throat> to be scored and also um the internet uh, we're waiting for the proposal from uh, the education foundation now keep in mind that won't have anything to do with the uh, direct um budget that would be cares act it has to do with the wi-fi so that won't go into the balance of the 61 i can't i apologize 61,000 whatever that the 31250 is coming out of that's actually from the cares act budget separately under the internet part of, of the CARES Act budget. And so we're waiting to hear back from them because they've already done this, they've already distributed them. So they they have the model. And so we had uh, Christine Long um, helped us uh, get in contact with them. And uh, or I, I think she made the, the um, connection with staff and Education Foundation to help us get that done and make it easy and and um, fluid um, distribution of those uh, that equipment. So that's all I have. So. Okay, so I just have a couple of questions. All righty. Um, can you hear me? I have a couple of questions. Um, yes. You said that you yourself and Mrs. Uh, Miss Rhonda 
you're going to recuse yourself from voting on all of the proposals or just the ones that you feel like you have personal or business all of, in? All of them. Well, all, well scoring, 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 on, scoring on all of them. <clears throat> scoring on all of them because the whole entire uh, staff and, and the board and the committee members that were there, um, if, if let's say I don't score on those two, then and Miss Gindelsberger doesn't score on the one. It'll throw the scoring off. Okay. okay. So we don't score on anything, and then it's just seven people, and they'll make the scores. You know, okay. you know, mess up the scoring. Okay, I understand. All right, and my second question is on the on the uh, the T-Mobile devices. You do not have a proposal from from that vendor. As not to as of yet. Okay. okay. But they, I, I um. Uh, I believe, um, I don't know if it's been sent yet, but it was requested at the meeting Tuesday that a notice be sent to them um, stating that they had till the 14th of May to get that to us. Uh, we had hoped to have already had it, but we also didn't say, hey, we need it by this date. And so, therefore, um, it was supposed to have been, uh, or there being uh, something sent by staff to them stating they, that we need it by the 14th. Okay, and uh, I guess that leads to something else, but you you're saying that 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 proposal, whatever it may look like, could possibly come from under CARES dollars. Are yes. we making are we making sure that the other proposals we have on the table that if we don't fund them or if something happens with them, those vendors can't come back and say why weren't they considered under CARES dollars? Well, I mean, if if in my opinion. Once they're once they're the scored and found to be, you know, once those are scored and the committee finds that they should be funded, if there's a way to fund them under something on CARES, I, I think we should look into that. But no. we need to get over the first hump for, you know, initially get over the first hump. And before you speak, before you speak, Miss Gillis, I just want to say this. I'm only asking to just make sure the slates stay clean. That's all. Right, no, I, I totally agree. Okay. I, totally agree. Okay. I just wanted everybody to understand that the money for the Wi-Fi services isn't part of the, because this was asked in the committee meeting, and so I wanted to clarify it. It's not going to be part of the, it's not coming out of the uh, the money that was set aside for the, the 61,000 okay. and some change that was, uh, the proposals was coming out of. So I don't want to think, oh, well, why are we doing all this work if Epic's already got half and there's only half I left. Yeah, I, understand. I just wanted to make sure that we had a clear that everybody on the tape on the call had a clear understanding. So, Miss awesome. Gillis, thank you, Miss uh, Anderson. Miss Gillis, um, uh, Madam Chair, just wanted to clear something up. There is no line item for uh, proposals on the CARES line. Where we're tapping into is communications for education and job. So that's why the T-Mobile fits under that category. But really, there is no line item for any other vendor. Um, but we do have, however, have a line item for the new grant um, for the vendors that um, Ms. Anderson has spoken on, if that clears it up. Now, is that, li is that line item for what I was thinking, what I was asking Maria and maybe I should ask this the other day, and I apologize, but I'm going to ask it now while it's on my ADD brain. Um, is it out of the realm of possibility that some of these proposals could not fall under CARES Act if they're if the MPIs or whatever, if they're scrutinized and found that they could fall under? The only line item that we have available is for a communication, like internet um, type um, line item for the cares that's left over to spend all the other ones have been accounted for so um that's why the board uh, recommended on the new grant to um, set aside dollars for um, these proposals so we're, the line item that i'm that i'm talking about in the cares line is actually for internet services whether the customer comes in and already has services and we're paying their their bill it comes out of that same line item. We were just trying to get creative for individuals that could not get internet in order to, um, 
you know, get a, a, a mechanism that they could get internet, but that was the, what the, this board voted on for the CARES money way back when. I was, I, I was aware of that that was coming out of that CARES that I was looking for my sheet from the other day for the budget. I thought there was, okay, that's something I'll look into. I, I thought there was more money elsewhere, but I could be mistaken. I have been once or twice. Madam Chair, this is William Thomas. Um, I have, well, I have three things I want to point on, touch on. One, uh, I would say a huge congratulations to all those involved with giving the number of proposals that we had submitted. I think that was outstanding because in years past, uh, that's been something that uh, we've always uh, heralded on. Number two, I like to circle back to the CARES Act funding. Um, and, and again, I'm asking for education, Madam Chair, on this. To, in reviewing the reports, I see an educational assistance category. Uh, I think it's, um, and, and I'll say this, and again, it's something uh, obviously we can approach the entire board and get some thoughts on. At, at the end of the day, my intention and point of concern is to be able to fund as many uh, pro programs as we can. Uh, in light of things that are balancing out now. Yes, I understand we have crisis. I understand we have the issues of the pandemic, uh, but I, I am uh, along the lines of finding a way to utilize the CARES Act funding to uh, fund one of those programs, whichever program it may be. And one of my questions I have regarding the educational assistance. Otherwise, my observation based on the financial spending is that majority of the funding is going into a financial crisis or crisis assistance. And I would bet to say that about 90% of those funds would be uh, spent in the CARES Act component on crisis census and crisis assistance. I just think we need to have a little more of a balance. So uh, again, I may be wrong in, in as far as what we're allowed to do, but I will express my, my, my concern or objective would be to to fund the maximum number of programs we can. I'm ideally looking at three. Um, Madam Chair, this is Kelly Mistretta. If I could just interject for just a moment. The adopted budget that was approved by the uh, Department of Economic Opportunity. Uh, when I submit a budget, I have to be very detailed in what we will be funding and what we will be spending. For the education assistance line, there is 331,500 under the CARES budget that was adopted. But the budget for that is very specific. It was to pay for tuition, fees, books, um, on the job training, certifications, pre apprenticeships. So if you stray away from that, that will require us to uh, have the board vote on a modification and then submit that to the DEO and for them to approve it. So we okay. can change the direction of how that money is being spent. Okay, so my thing is it, and that was my point. If there's money in the education, Part, which is what you're saying, Ms. Mistrada, and I've read these proposals, which obviously Mr. Thomas has as well, and, and I think we're both on the same track here together. Some of these fall under that, under that, you know, education and and training and what have you. I mean, is that, maybe I'm misunderstanding him, but I, I some of these I think would fall under that. Personally, I mean, I, I don't know why they wouldn't. But Madam Chair, this is William Thomas again. Sorry, Kelly. I, I get what Mr. Bestrada is stating, but she also noted a, a modification. I, I think, um, and again, I know the challenge obviously is, is acquiring a quorum. I think it's something we do need to look into. I would ask that uh, uh, Madam Chair and staff uh, look at options. I know you talked about modifications. We've done modifications before. I know there's a threshold as to what modification would look as a negative versus uh, business as usual under the CARES Act component of these uh, CBD funds we're getting. Um, I just think that's something that might need to be explored. Uh, explore it, and if nothing, obviously, Madam Chair, comes out of that, so be it. But I, I just would like to make sure that question is on the table and noted uh, that we did uh, explore opportunities to apply funding that we oversee uh, both categories, both the direct client services and the CARES Act funding, and maximize that to uh, provide opportunities in light of what's going on to more than one or two programs or proposals. That's all, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, if I may, um, just to, to piggyback off what Mr. Thomas stated, 
So I guess um, what staff would need is for the budget and finance committee to come up with some recommendations and then present it to the entire board. And when we do have a quorum, then it can be voted on and then we could send it off to DEO for consideration. Thank you. That's what I was going to suggest that uh, budget and finance uh, work diligently with staff to uh, narrow down exactly what uh, Mr. Thomas is proposing <coughs> and then have a, a, a presentation uh, prepared to bring back to the board uh, so everybody have a clear understanding of what's being asked. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Madam Chair, um, I want to be in order. I certainly have had my hand raised, but maybe I'm doing something wrong. I'm I can't honest. see. I'm sorry, Miss Noreen Copeland Miller. Um, I take the fault for that. I can't see it. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I have my screen okay. set up where I can see your hand. My apologies. Okay, okay I'm going to take my hand down then and I'm just jumping. Now I see your hand. I'm sorry. My <laughs> fault. <laughs> Take your hand okay. out, dear. <laughs> All right. Yes, ma'am. So um, what I wanted to say is um, I think when we talk about CSBG dollars, those nine proposals that we have, once they are scored with the Rubik, is if any of those meet that criteria, then I think that the they can be forwarded on to the budget and finance committee. If they meet that criteria, what Kelly was talking about from the CSBG dollars, then that may be a recommendation to move them over for care if they meet that criteria. Now, that was my first thing. And my second question is this, because I have done some research with that T-Mobile with the hotspot, and um, it appears that that's a free service um, that they give the hotspots out to the community. And I know when we've had discussion about the Education Foundation, it looks like they're asking for $97,000 to distribute free hotspots. So, It'll be interesting for us to see that proposal, what is their role and how does that work? Because if those are free hotspots to the community, it does not make sense to me that we're giving $97,000 or whatever that figure is to the Education Foundation uh, to distribute when T-Mobile is giving them free to the community. But again, we don't have that proposal to really look at what they're proposing their service will be. So it w I encourage the board members to make sure that we look at it and make sure that it meet the NPIs, all of them, when we are scoring them. And if there's um, Education Foundation is under the CARES Act, I think we need to make sure we look at that uh, very well when we uh, vote to do whatever, if that happens. But also with the CSBG dollars, that's a separate one with those proposals. We just got to make sure that they meet the NPIs as well. And those that might fall under other criteria make a recommendation to move it over there. Thank you, ma'am. This this is if I can, Madam Chair, this is what they're giving out for free. This. Yes, ma'am. I'm familiar with them. I actually have I have some here in my desk drawer that yeah. we provide to our residents for free. But I only get this for that came from T Mobile. It, so the housing authority care. also distributes these for free that we got from T-Mobile. So just I'm familiar with what they are. So, but we don't have a proposal from from the vendor. So until we get a proposal, really it's a mute discussion. Um, and then once the proposal come in, of course it'll go plan evaluation. We discuss with budget and finance who's going to work with staff to see where if, where a proposal like that could be funded through. And we just follow the process. That's why we have processes in place to make sure we check off all the boxes um, uh, in the whole procedure. So, yeah, I, I hadn't heard of 97. I, I didn't know we had the actual figure yet. So, again, we need to just wait for the proposal and see. Um, because I agree with Noreen, that is a lot of, you know, I am about wasteful spending. So, that yeah, is a so lot of money. <laughs> so we will wait for the proposal and of course plan evaluation like I said will do their portion and then uh, budget and finance and staff will work on bringing some information to the board uh, for further discussion uh, around any changes that might be potentially or could be potentially made in the overall budget. So let me I'm gonna just double check make sure I'm not missing anybody's hand. 
Uh, Miss, Miss, uh, Madam, I see your hand. Oh, I see your little tiny hand in the corner. Little tiny hand right up here, right? Well, in all due respect to my uh, distinguished colleagues, my hand was up before any of them started asking questions. And uh, because there was something that uh, Ms. Anderson had mentioned uh, and that I wanted to just ask a question on it, it's, it's much more simple. So, in all due respect to my colleagues, uh, I'm sorry. That, that's fine. I, I understand it. It is a little hard. It needs a little color in there. But um, first of all, can, uh, I reiterate what uh, Mr. Thomas is saying in terms of uh, congratulations on recusing yourself. And I appreciate the transparency. Be sure that uh, that is mentioned at our CAP board meeting. So it is on record. And uh, so we really appreciate that. With regards to the rubrics, uh, how many of the rubrics that you are looking for in terms of Having all of the proposals scored. Right, right now we have we, we had a total of nine, um, and with with Epic being sent for a vote because, like I said, they've been in mothball, so we it's only fair that we we go ahead and send for the uh, board to vote to fund that. Uh, so then that leaves us with eight. So we have a total of eight, and like was said before, I'm I'm really excited about that. We've got everybody. You know, motivated, and we're not at the end of the year shuffling like we usually are, and so that's really awesome. Um, and as far as transparency, sometimes people say I'm too transparent, but I don't think there's such a thing. I don't you know, think so either. I don't. So, think so. so you say there are eight proposals, eight. and you're, and you're looking for all eight of them to have these equal number of rubrics scored on each of them. Yes. So if you get if you get a rubric from a member and they've only scored three of them. The only recommendation is you have to throw that out. Exactly, because it has to be it has to be consistent, and that's mm -hmm. why it was discussed during our meeting that it best for Ms. Skindlesberger and I to back and not to score any um, our our scores not to count at all. Um, because believe me, there's other ones on here I have nothing to do that I'd love to you know uh, score, and because they're wonderful programs I've read them all, you know and. And the you know, questions asked the other day, and I mean, I was sitting going, I read that, and that's not the way I read it, but you know, I just stay in neutral, you know. Okay. But um, you're absolutely correct, and that's the only way we can because it needs to be an even playing field, and you can't get an even playing field if somebody only does three and doesn't do eight. And so, okay. that's, hopefully, the letter went out to uh, from staff to the committee that how important it was. We need those by the 14th, and we need them to score all eight. So. Okay, okay, thank you. And and Madam Chair, I yield to uh, uh, Miss Noreen Miller, whose little hand is up. <laughs> thank you, um, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I hear what you're saying about if a person only scores three and you throw them out. I uh, think that I don't think that's appropriate. I think if they only th score three, then you value that person's um, time and effort they put in. Uh, doing that work because I do applaud the fact that we have so many uh, proposals and I thank the committee chair for extending the date to the 14th and it's seven members on that in that committee. I hope that all seven participate and that they're all done. But if they're not all done, whatever the committee members send in, you want to make sure you take that into account. Now, make put emphasis in the letter that please score all seven, all uh, nine, eight of the proposals. But a lot of times people may not have that time to do it all, but whatever that the committee receives, I certainly hope that it is considered because to just throw it out, it's not that because you're going to have votes on all of them because we already got one member that's completed all of them and you'll probably have more completed. But what if you have one person completed some, but their time is still valuable? I would like to see that considered, not throw anything out because I don't think that's appropriate to throw out a person's work. And we don't have that ability because it should be considered. Uh, and I thank you for the extension. And I hope we put emphasis on to the committee members. It's critical that they do score all seven of them, all nine of them, or eight, whatever it is. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little confused. But if they take the time to score any, we should certainly consider that because the committee members, a lot of people are working, a lot of people have job responsibilities increased, but they still want to participate and submit to the process. So please reconsider throwing it out because the committee, when we met, no one said anything about throwing out uh, what was submitted. 
thank you. That's all I have. My, my well, understanding well, and the reason why Ms. Gindelsberger and I were asked to not score on anything was that if they don't, if we don't do all of them, it will throw, it will skew the scores. It was, it's, it's not something that I'm saying, okay, if you don't do all your homework, you don't, you get an F. It's not like that. It, it will skew the scores. If we only, like myself, there's eight here, if I only score six, then it skews the score. It knocks them out of whack. Uh, you know what I'm saying? So that wasn't my, I would have never thought of that, to be honest with you, until it was brought to my attention. And so, therefore, it's not like I don't value. If you work for me or have ever worked for me, you would know I value everybody's opinion. Um, and I want to hear, we, we, we have a, a meeting here every week with Frontline. I want to hear everybody's opinion because great ideas come from five-year-olds. I, I get ideas from my grandchildren sometimes and we have developed new programs. But if it's going to adjust the scores by doing that, we can't, that, that could affect somebody else negatively is my understanding. If, if someone on staff is, if I'm not explaining this correctly, please, you know, that was my understanding of why we were asked to step back from all of them. So, yeah, so Ms. Anderson, excuse me, Ms. Noreen, uh, excuse me just for a second. Mr. Henderson's hands been, uh, he put his real hand up so he made sure I see this kind of I, I, was, I was addressing Ms. I was addressing Ms. Miller first and I was yes, going to, I yes, saw the real hand. I saw the bear fall like I do. So yeah, I got yes, you. Mr. Henderson. Yes, uh, I want to acknowledge Mr. Henderson, but before we go too, too deep into this, uh, after Mr. Henderson speaks, do we have staff? You know, we're, we're being faced with situations that we've never seen with before. So uh, I'm going to depend on you guys to chime in and help direct uh, on the process and, and where we need to go. But we're going to hear what Mr. Henderson has to say. Thank you, Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, I totally agree with you, Ms. Anderson, that it does skew the, uh, the, the score, uh, unless you're going to do it by percentage. And, and there's a way to do that. But, you know, we're not... Uh, you know, Ms. Mistrata is probably the only one who can really help us with that. But I did want to add, uh, first of all, say that it, this is not a, um, this is not an option. Um, I remember when I was more involved with the uh, scholarships and scoring those scholarships. It, and when I was with uh, on the board at WEDU and we had to score all of those uh, Be More Awards, we could not leave any of them out. We had to score them all. If we we're gonna take on that responsibility, a score one, that means we have to score them all. And so I, I would, would like to hear from Ms. Gordon, uh, and she probably has the best recollection in terms of when we did, because I don't see uh, uh, Ms. Adano on the, on, on the call, but uh, with regards to the scholarships, and, and we had to score those scholarships. I remember having to go through all those scholarships and, and making sure that we did give a report. Uh, please comment on that. Turn it on, Ms. Gordon. We can hear you, and I want to acknowledge too, Ms. Noreen, that I do see your hand. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I hear what Mr. Henderson is saying, and I certainly have worked on some of those with the scholarships and other uh, things when we vote. Again, throwing them out, I just think is inappropriate. And we, we're talking about probably $30,000 now once we move forward, but to score them all, if possible, fine. But whatever you receive from your committee members, we should value that input. Everybody, hopefully all seven members will score all of them, but if they don't get to do them all, whatever you receive in for the vote or for that different proposal, I think that you wanna count that. I don't think it's gonna be screwed. The reason that Ms. Anderson, you and Ms. Uh, and Rhonda were asked to recuse yourself is because you were you're uh, connected to those proposals. So they asked you to recuse yourself. We ask that you recuse yourself from that process. And uh, under the Robert Rules of Order, you recuse yourself when you're part of that item coming up. But the committee, I guess, decided you recuse yourself from everything. So we went along with that. But in uh, protocol when you're connected to a proposal you recuse yourself because you can't vote on or have input but and, and you 
decided to recuse you from everything, which was what you all decided on, but it was not the norm. And I just went on with that. I tried to voice that opinion. When you're connected, that's when you recuse yourself. When you don't have anything to do with the other proposal, you can and should in the normal and other settings that I work with on boards, um, they are able to vote on other things that's not related to them. But I understand what you're saying. My point is, if you get any uh, rubrics from any other committee members, please consider them because it, the, oh, it, see you throw it, it out. It looks like they didn't participate when they did participate. And maybe not all the way, because a lot of times we get caught up and don't, don't are not able to do them all. I've been on that scholarship committee. I did a lot. We've had lots of them in, but sometimes I didn't get to all of them. But the work I put in was considered. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Copeland Miller. So we're gonna move on to Ms. Gordon so she can um she can speak. Yeah, I mean in my opinion, the the strategy that the committee um, uh, decided it works um, that way the scoring isn't skewed. You want the same people scoring all of the proposals. You don't want it all mixed up. And if you have um, more members scoring a proposal and less members scoring another, it puts one proposal in in a favorable um, position. If if that makes any sense. So, I, I, in my opinion. Um, the methodology that the committee de decided on, it works and it'll be fair and transparent. So what so, needs to happen is that each committee member need to make sure that they score all seven proposals in order for them to, for their, for their, uh, theirs to be counted. That's correct. Uh, that, yes. All eight proposals, I'm sorry, for theirs to be counted. So the email going out to the committee members um, Sharon, I'm not sure. I saw something from Derek this morning. I'm not sure what exactly what it was, mm -hmm. and I was on the call. But if he has not, or maybe if you need to, Derek, um, I see your name here. I'm sorry. I can address you directly. I apologize. Um, if you have not sent out something regarding that to the committee members, if you would just tell them that it is vital, and in order for their um, suggestions to be counted, then they need to ensure that they. Um, score all eight of the proposals on the table. And if this is something that we need to discuss further, and you know, uh, I I uh, I hope that planning evaluation will work with staff. So going forward that we don't, you know, have uh, that it's that it's clear that when a person gets on a committee, a volunteers to be on a committee, that they follow the process, they understand they need to follow the process completely as written prior to them agreeing to be on the committee. Okay. So, thank you so much. Madam uh, Chair, it looks like uh, Ms. Gillis has her hand up. Oh, I, I mean these little tiny hands, so I'm sorry, y'all. Ms. Gillis. Um, th thank you, Mr. Henderson. Uh, the only thing I wanted to share is this would be in line with how um, the county does procurement um, bids and how uh, we also hire staff. Um, we have a panel. Um, every panel member must interview all the panelists. Um, every um, person that's reviewing contracts must review all of them. So it does have um, you know some basis of why we're doing it this way and, and some history. Okay, thank you again. We just want to make sure that that we're clear when 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 we sign up for committees that we understand what our responsibility is uh, as a committee member and that we need to follow the process as written um, in order not to have any conflict. Okay. So, and, and, and that was my whole when I stepped up and said, I have two conflicts and then Rhonda said, oh, me too. And we threw it out there, and then a discussion was had, and that's how it was brought to us. So, um, yes, ma'am. Yeah. And that's all I have. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, moving right along to public information, I see Ms. Ms. Sardano is not on the call. Ms. Gordon, do you have any updates um, from Ms. Sardano? Yes, I do. 
Um, so regarding the scholarships, we received a total of 84 scholarships and 75 of them are approved. Out of the uh, 75, um, we have 11 uh, applicants that are pending their enrollment letters. So potentially, we could potentially have 75 applicants that would be approved, um, totaling $335,000. So even though we don't know the exact amount um, for the scholarship uh, program category, I, I don't foresee that line item based on a percentage being $335,000. So the cap would need to determine um, uh, if you want to fund that entire amount, um, or we proceed with the first come first serve as uh, decided by the committee and the board. And May 16th is a deadline to get the enrollment letters. Um, so. If some of the 11 didn't, that could decrease it, but at the end, um, potentially 75 applicants. Okay, um, um, Ms. Anderson, I saw your hand. So, so what you're trying to say is that uh, once again this year, we could potentially fund everybody again? No, that's not what she said. She, okay, that, that's I was just trying to get some clarity. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. She said that there's 84 that we received 84 scholarships, 75 were approved, and of that 75, 11 are pending their yeah. letters, which takes us way over what we typically budget um, for scholarships. It takes us, uh, if I'm looking at it correctly, and my memory serves me correctly, we're looking at right at $100,000 more than what we typically budget for uh, every year for this for this round. So um, Ms. Gordon's bringing that point to our attention so that we're not surprised and when we see that, that huge number and it will be up to the board to decide, you know, if we're going to try and put $335,000 in that line item, which would decrease services going to some, going, you know, from other line items, or if we're going to follow a first come first serve basis on how we award the scholarships. Did I, I just, that? I correct? just think it's wonderful. We got that many applications this year. So. Okay, so that's food for thought for, for, for everybody. Um, any com any other comments on that one, Mr. Vice Chair? I see you. I don't see your hand, but I see your face. <laughs> I'm good, thank you, Madam Chair. You've been over the scholarships before. Any, any thoughts around that? You, you know, I, I've always been pushing for uh, the scoring of the scholarships, and it and and I think out of all the years I've been on this board, I think we've only been able to do that a couple of times and have resorted to basically the first come first serve and, and thank thank god that we're in a position to be able to accommodate uh those but uh no i don't have any thoughts on it just taking it all in thank you okay so uh miss gordon that's just a quick question and, and and i and i may should have should know this information but i need a refresher so if we do a first come first serve that's just based on when the application was received right it's not based on any type of scoring or essay because we eliminated that part right it's a complete application um that's correct so basically if you go first come first serve then we will pull we will pull out of the pool of 59 and then those 11 um well actually the 11 that's remaining they would they're out of the they're out of the mix because they haven't provided their fall enrollment letters. So we would pull out the 7559. I'm sorry, the 59 is a disregard that 59. I was looking okay. at it. It's, it's irrelevant. But out of the um, 11 that have not provided their fall enrollment letters, that, that, that takes care of those that are eliminated. So we'll be pulling out of the um, first of the. Um, the first of the 64. Oh, the first of the 64. Okay, so um, uh, that's a board decision. Uh, um, 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 uh, Ms. Gillis, Ms. Mastrada, any comments on that? Uh, any thoughts? <laughs> uh, this is Kelly. I would just uh, caution you. 
with this and also on the other proposals that the board would be voting on, we do not have the award from the state. So there has been no indication that our award is going to differ dramatically from what it was this year. So all the budget planning documents are based on the estimated amount of what you had this year, which was $1,014,920 for direct client assistance. Once we get our award, if it's reduced, um, historically they were reducing it 10% every year. And when we did our budget planning, we always reduced it by 10% every year. Uh, this year, we did not do that based on all the uncertainty with uh, the pandemic. But if they come back and they reduce your budget by 10%, you may have less money for all of the things that you already voted on that you wanted to base your budget percentage wise on, which would of course reduce all those categories. If they come back and it's more money, then you would have more money in all those categories and you may choose to move some of that money around. Um, I just wanted to, to caution you that everything that you're discussing and voting on is based on the estimated budget of exactly where you were this year. And I did check with the state this morning and our uh, fiscal year 21 <coughs> is not showing yet. So we're just in a holding pattern until we get that award. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for, for the clarification. Mr. Uh, Henderson. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Hill. And thank you, Mr. Thomas, for pointing me out, I think. I saw you, I saw you this time. <laughs> no, um, so so basically this becomes a, a race to the to the top uh, for um, those who have complete applications and they meet the minimum requirements and all of that good all that, all of that good stuff. Unfortunately. You know, for those who might have forgotten something along the way, but they're really outstanding students. They're just out of luck. Is what was this way this is going? In my mind, I had to really think that through. Um, but uh, the one point I do want to make that it, it, if it's definitely that this is the route that we're going, and as Ms. Mistrada pointed out with regards to the funding, we want to make sure that we put some kind of disclaimer on any information that we put out there. Uh, that you know, funding is will be made available based upon um, you know DEO decision or whatever the 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 the, the wording should be, uh, so that we have a, I don't want to say an escape route, but we have we have uh, the ability to be able to say you know we did let you know in advance that unfortunately we didn't get funding. I suspect we'll get notice of our funding well before. The uh, distribution of, of of scholarship, I hope, Ms. Mistrada. But again, just to protect ourselves, we definitely want to put some kind of disclaimer out there, and on all the material. Um, I yeah, I, and I think it's going to be important for the board to understand that. I think in the three years that I've been on the board, this will be the first time that we've not been able to fund the majority of the scholarship applications that were presented to us. So this is gonna be, you know, something different for the board to, uh, to, to comprehend and it to sink in that we push for turnout and we got turnout, but there's no guarantee that we have money. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, and we just have to move on from there, so. Food for thought. <laughs> I have to take more money. <laughs> um, Madam Chair, food for thought. But I, I do. I would like to elaborate or have some some elaboration from you or from the staff members with regards to uh, uh, having a disclaimer on our materials in the meantime. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, yes, Mr. Henderson. On the application, it does state that. That applications may be awarded on first come first serve. It, it took into account both that they they may be awarded on first come first serve, and we've stressed the importance of getting their information in as, as soon as possible. Um, so yes, we did. It, it's clear. No, no, I'm sorry, Miss Gordon. The, and this is with regards to uh, the availability of funds. I would have to look back at the application, but. It, I would have to look back at the application to make sure that that's clearly stated. Yeah, am, am, I, am I making myself clear? Uh, clear yeah. understand? Okay. You are. You are. Yeah, yeah you are. Because um, that, that's kind of like a disclaimer that we use over here on the grants, just to say when we're when we're proposing something, we let clients know that it's based upon the funding that's available and how long we receive the funding. 
So I'm sure staff has something in place. Um, just maybe you just need to make it uh, public if it's not public. Um, or and have it as backup and share it. I'm, I'm assured that when we do a first come first serve, we're using something as far as a, a time frame or a date stamp or something that if we're questioned, that we can show that this person came before that person. Kind of. That is, yes. Okay. All right. Thank well, you. I'm I'm satisfied. Thank you so much. Um, moving on for the essence of time. I know we got about ten or twelve minutes left in our set um, time that we had set. Our nomination and membership committee. Miss Noreen Copeland Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm going to move. Um, Quickly with this, the uh, nomination and membership committee, uh, the nomination and membership committee met on May the third, and uh, we brought a draft um, slate. Uh, Derek did send out the emails to the board members to encourage them to uh, submit their name if they're interested in being an officer, and we received. Um, Responses back. I'm going to ask Derek if he would share the slate with the board that we came up with with the um, executive committee. Derek, would you please share that? Thank you. I don't know if you could, can you make it a little bigger, please, if possible. Let me see. Are you all able to see that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, this is the slate, and as you can see, we have uh, received information from uh, we've seen received nominations from folks for uh, the for the chair, and we have some for the vice chair. We received folks from the secretary, as well as the parliamentarian, and so this uh, slate is. Uh, ready to be presented to i would like to present the slate to the full board at the board meeting so that um we can do nominations from the floor in case someone missed it and so we can move on and ready to vote in june and uh of course with the recommendation from this board i want everybody to see what we have on place and i know Derek sent out emails to the folks to make sure that they were uh, okay with their name being on the slate and if that was their um, uh, recommendation, if that was what they wanted to do. And he sent out that email and got back the response that the folks listed uh, confirmed that this is their interest. Is that correct, Derek? That is correct with uh, one exception. I never heard back from Mr. Morales, um, who was nominated for the parliamentarian. Um, but I mean, I think we could, you know, that could be part of the discussion at the next cab meeting if he was happy to stay on or not. I mean, I, I don't know how the board would like to proceed. Everyone else replied though. Everyone else replied with uh, they were uh, fine with being um, nominated for that candidacy or or however it is, it shakes out now. Okay. And so I wanted to share this with the executive committee to see if you if uh, had any recommendations about it my only one recommendation i i did have was because mr henderson is in for the chair and looks like he's not opposed but we also have his name for the vice chair and i was thinking in terms of with his uh approval that we take his name from the vice chair and leave it up at the chair because it's there and he's unopposed so i don't know that but again it's up to this committee to uh look at that part of it because that's he and the secretary are the two that are unopposed. Madam so, Chair, if I may, the only reason I would say to leave it is because we don't know if we're going to have any write in candidates. Right. Okay. That's a good uh, suggestion. So I do want this committee to look at it because I would like to uh, present it at the board meeting on next week. So we can move along because in June we are required to vote. And uh, have the new officers in place. I mean, for July. But one of my other things is the vote. How last year we did um, electronic vote. Part and I. Uh, will we go that way? What is the direction that this committee recommend at this for this year? 
or should that be a board discussion on next week? No, isn't it? Is wasn't it my understanding that we had to, um, Sharon? You can correct me if I'm wrong. After speaking with legal, that we had to, we were required to do it the way that we did it, um, the last round where everybody had to actually state their preference allowed in order to be in compliance. Am I correct or am I wrong? That is correct. Yes. Um, for for transparency in the Sunshine Law. So explain that process, Sharon, so we be very clear. Please. Well, we can't hear you. You're muted. Oh. That mute button. Are you able to hear me now? No, we couldn't hear Sharon. It's oh. like the, it's like that little hand button. It always runs away. No, my <laughs> mute button is hidden. So I think I clicked it and I don't, and I don't know, I'm just off right now, but either way, um, how we did it last time, just based on, um, advice from our attorney, our legal department, who we sought advice through. Every board member decided, uh, who they wanted to vote and they stated it clearly during the meeting so that it could be recorded. And then at the end, um, it was like, a a voice vote, everyone. Stated I or nay or whatever, and that's how each person was, um determined if I was clear enough in how I explained it. Any questions? Okay, so okay. they did an I vote and uh, did they were there inner hands raised as well? No, because it was I think during that time we were all virtual. So because okay. it was challenging seeing each other, we just did a voice vote. Everyone stated who they wanted to select for each slate for each um okay. officer position. All right, thank you. So, mm -hmm. my only recommendation is that the initials on the side of each one of the candidates that those initials be removed, and we submit the names with the um, uh, office that they're interested in to the board on next um, next week. Mm -hmm. That's the recommendation. Okay, I, I, that's easy for me to do. Thanks, Miss Nori. Okay, and that's the recommendation for the committee. Um, with that, and that concludes my. Um, Report, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Copeland Miller. I'm looking for hands. Looking for hands. Looking for hands. I don't see any hands. Okay. All right. So, Madam Chair, I'm yeah. sorry. Can I, I don't. I'm starting. It's film similar to how the Board of County Commissioners vote. They each, and that's how we modeled it for the virtual, so that just for consistency. So if that makes any helps. And that's yes, fine. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Doreen. Uh, board attendance review is next on the agenda. I know we had one um, one person that was scheduled. Uh, Ms. Um, Janine was um, was supposed to show up at our last meeting. Uh, I'm not sure if she not or she did or where she, we. She was in attendance uh, virtually. Right. She was attending. Okay, virtually. Great. So she is in compliance. So we don't have any other staff that's out of compliance as far as uh, staff. I'm sorry. I'm thinking about what I need to do next. We don't have any board members that's out of compliance um, as of now, right? The, the board, there are no board members out of compliance. I cannot speak to the staff out of compliance. Okay, yeah, so I don't know about the staff either. Okay, thank you. Uh, his, yes, I'm sorry, Ms. Norrie. Okay, and with um, your board members that are going to be coming off um, July 1st, you will still be in compliance. The board will still be in compliance because we have that extra one. So, okay. with piece we won't we, even with them coming off, you'll still have a, a, a being compliant with the EO. Okay, great, great, great. Thank you for bringing that up. Hadn't thought about that. Uh, Hillsborough County 2019 needs assessment survey uh, received a request from Mr. Vice Chair, Mr. Henderson to circle back to the needs assessment and uh, have some discussion around it. So, Mr. Uh, Vice Chair, uh, if you would just explain to me, uh, uh, your thoughts and what you would like to see. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Uh, my daughter came to me. Uh, she's a uh, member of the uh, 2020 cohort of the Leadership Training Institute for uh, TOBA. And she and her colleagues are working on a project for East Tampa. And she came to me asking for some statistics. I said, oh, I got the great tool for the greatest tool for you, which is a, the 2019 needs assessment that was done. Um, and, and for your convenience, I did go through, I, I was, I reviewed it and I did hyperlink the, uh, the, uh, the uh, table of contents uh, for easy access and manipulation of, of the uh, document. But in reviewing it, I realized that there was no uh, reviewing it again, but it didn't catch me. I didn't catch it the 1st time. There is no page 56 or an appendix B that's listed in in the uh, table of contents. And uh, so not that it's a deal breaker or anything. It's just evidently was something that was missed in, along the way. Uh, also, I think it's important that we share this document with our new board members. And I don't know if that is already part of their orientation or their onboarding. Um, we, we probably need to revisit the onboarding, not just or just get an update from staff what the onboarding process is. And then finally, um, I wanted us to revisit this uh, this uh, report, this survey, to just kind of see where we are in the process with regards to the recommendations. And that basically summarizes what I was looking at there, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. So I'll I'll um, I'll, I'll move from staff on to address that, Miss Gillis, Miss Gordon. Um, uh, Mr. Henderson, the um, needs assessment is uh, reviewed with um, our on onboarding training um, and is provided for that wonderful big book that we <laughs> provided. Um, but thank you for bringing that up. I think it's important for us to maybe go into a little bit more detail when we do um, have that onboarding training with new new members. Thank you. And, uh, and with regards to the uh, Recommendations, uh, I mean, do we measure if we've come so far or do we identify what's been what we've been able to achieve out, out of that report? Because at some point, uh, 2019 is, is going to be a far distance and there's going to be uh, time for us to do look at a new needs assessment. Um, what we do is we use it for the planning that the board does. Um, it's that's the only reason or the only thing that we use it for is uh, for this board to do planning. And I believe that in our planning session, uh, it was reviewed um, in order to make decisions on how spending would be made. Thank you. And and, Ms., and I've just had Ms., to Ms. Gillis, we provided we supplied the needs assessment to Collaborative Labs. Um, and that's how they were able to develop the pieces of their, um, their strategic planning uh, process. So, yes. Wonderful. Thank you for the, those reminders. So, Ms. Copeland, Miller? Madam Chair, I do have a question for staff, because I believe, and help me with this, that every two years that DEO requires a need assessment be completed. Um, it's it's actually more than that, and we are. It's funny that you mention uh, staff actually has a meeting Tuesday to um, talk about planning uh, to bring uh, information to the board. So we're we're already planning for next year. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Miss Gordon, Miss Gillis, and thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, for bringing that up. I'm, I'm assuming page 56 in Appendix B is was left blank intentionally. And it's not, it wasn't anything vital to the overall proposal that was missing. So, um, staff, if you could just double check that and, 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 and just to, uh, you can just uh, let Mr. Henderson know, uh, if there was, should have been some content content on page 56 or uh, appendix B attached. This staff review. Thank you. Thank you for bringing it up. Okay, so we can just have clearly answer all of his questions. All right, uh, before we move to Department of Social Services, I just want to say that um, we received the proclamation yesterday from the Board of uh, County Commissioners. Uh, thank you to Mr. Henderson, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, and Mr. Um, William Thomas for being online with myself and Ms. Ziegler. Um, 
it was a great proclamation. It was quite lengthy uh, to be read online. So I would love to see it in print <laughs> so I can actually read it and know what it says. <laughs> Uh, and maybe if we can share just um, a print with the board members so they'll know uh, what the proclamation says, because we will recognize, well, older, um, older American Month is the month of May, and that's the project I'm working on on my job. But I'm talking about the proclamation for Community Action Month on this call. So I'm trying to keep them all separated in my head uh, right now. So uh, just so we can share it staff uh, in a small print, maybe with the board, with all the board members. So they'll, you know, cause it's inclusive of everybody uh, on the board that volunteers their time. Okay. So thank you uh, so much for all you do. And thank you for uh, preparing such an awesome proclamation. Matt, Madam so, Chair. Yes, sir. I, I yield to Ms. Copeland Miller. Ms. Miller, you're on mute. Thank you, uh, Mr. Henderson. I do want to uh, say thanks to Derek for providing the link, and I was able to watch that presentation. You did an outstanding job, and Audrey did an outstanding job in this community action month. And of course, things are different, but we celebrated all the month of May, and you guys were fantastic. So I did want to just thank Derek for sending that out so that board members would have the opportunity to see that is more going on from the BOCC that appreciate the work that's being done by this board. Thank you. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, and I, I, yes, definitely, I definitely ditto uh, what uh, Ms. Copeland Miller is saying. You, you all did a, a fantastic job in representing and giving the uh, story about uh, community action. Uh, curious, um, are these proclamations, these framed proclamations, are they adorning the, the wall of the social services department or what? They are. They're on. They, they are. <laughs> okay, wonderful. We have quite a few of them, so thanks to you all, we have nice decorations that are relevant. A after ten years, you can start rotating them out. You know. <laughs> Thank you so much to everybody uh, for that, and uh, Commissioner Myers for um, uh, doing our presentation. So we are down to Department of Social Services, Ms. Ziegler, since you're not going to be next week. Yep, good afternoon again, and thank you all for, for meeting today. And thank you all, I was going to chime in when you were just talking about the proclamation, but I knew I was up next. So I reserved my comments, but even though we didn't have the opportunity for mo uh, most people to speak, I want you to know how important it is for you all to show up and be visible. It absolutely sends the message to the board that there's people that care, there's volunteers that are working hard. And I think, you know, it's different than just us telling them that than versus seeing you all there, even if we were in person in the audience, even having the group to stand up and recognize. So it means a lot to staff, everything that you all do, all the time you dedicate to rubrics and, um, you know, methodical programming and nonprofits and just everything you do. I mean, it's, if we had to create a job description for you, it's a heck of a job description and you do it in addition to everything else you do. So we don't say thank you enough. And I think community action month kind of keeps us fresh and that all the other months we celebrate the people in our community that need us and all the work that they do to become self-sufficient. But we absolutely should take the month of May and celebrate all the work that you all do as unpaid volunteers with so much on your plate and so much responsibility. So I'm um, glad that the commissioner customized the proclamation. She actually changed some of the stuff from what Commissioner Miller had, and that's why it was a little lengthier. She added a lot more language about the actual board and what the board does and not so much about the grant. So I think that's a great idea, Ms. Hill, to, to go ahead and share that with the board and read each of those lines and how meaningful it is for us. Um, for my update today, um, I, I just wanted to reiterate how important it is for attendance at the meetings. You all do so much work, and then the fact that we can't get the vote you know, is, is, is an ongoing challenge and I hope that we can overcome that challenge. Like I said, even if we can commit to getting a vote every other month and keep things moving, because all the dialogue is definitely here. All the passion is still here. People are still willing to dedicate the time to the meeting. We just have to, unfortunately, like Maria Gillis said earlier, have to abide by the governor's orders, which is to have an in-person quorum. And we did try to work with our county uh, attorney's office to alleviate that requirement. And because of the nature of this board and the fiduciary responsibility, it's not something that we can relinquish. 
And this board is unique. Other boards meet and have discussions and they can have a, a lot less responsibility because of the fiduciary responsibility here. I think that's what makes this board unique and so important in that in-person forum. So I don't wanna continue to harp on that, but I think that's the last unturned stone we have with COVID and that will make us whole again and we can keep doing all the good work we're doing if we can just get that in-person forum. Other than that, please continue to uh, refer to the emergency rental assistance program. We have a lot of funding left. Uh, people can reapply starting next month. So if they've received assistance already and they become past due again, they basically re-upload all the same eligibility criteria unless we were able to find a way to clone applications, which we haven't done that yet, but continue to promote that program for us. Your outreach means a lot to us and we can saturate all of those Brook County, not just certain pockets. So if you can get the word out, um, and even if they have um, income-based housing or it's, subs it's not subsidized as far as if they have the opportunity to report that their income was reduced and get their rent reduced that way, then those aren't eligible. But people that had reduced income to be eligible to for that lease in the beginning, those are eligible for our assistance also. So your efforts in continuing to promote that will be super, super helpful. And I'm available for questions if you have any. Thank you, uh, Ms. Gillis. Does anyone have any questions? Mr. Henderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, uh, and, and thank you, Ms. Gillis. That that was on my mind with regards to how are other boards uh, managing, you know, their 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 meetings and their votes and what have you. So thank you for sharing that, giving us a little insight. I will let you know that the county attorney's office did advise us that this is a consistent issue. It's not exclusive to this board. It's around the around the the county. All departments are struggling with having an in person quorum. But what makes our board unique is the fiduciary responsibility and the programming responsibility. So if we don't have your vote for the for the fiduciary part, then it affects or impacts programming. So that's where you all come into really having, you know, the, the vote being so meaningful to us and not just the dialogue. So um, you're more important and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ziegler. Uh, Ms. Gillis. Um, the only thing that I wanted to mention is that, um, first of all, commend this board for the work that you guys have done up to now um, with all the different uh, changes that have come down. But I wanted just to mention that now, more importantly than ever, um, the goal of self-sufficiency should be on our forefront. Uh, when we get our new grant, um, there's a lot of individuals that are getting back into the workplace and a lot of individuals that are going to need education and a lot of support. So um, I just want to stress that that now when we get our new um, our new funding for this coming year that um, this board looks back on getting people back to work and uh, self sufficient because for you know, like Mr Henderson mentioned a little while ago you know we've been in crisis mode but I think now's the opportunity for us to get back on track and and the goal of this board and and what it is and it's getting people to work and getting people self sufficient. With that, um, if I if you have any questions, okay, uh, no questions. Thank you so much, Miss Gordon. I do not have anything additional, but thank you so much for all of your service. I mean, a lot of what we do, we couldn't do without you. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Miss Gordon. Thank you to Miss Ziegler and Miss Gillis, because we wouldn't be able to do it, and Mister. Mr. Guida and Ms. Mastrada, we would not be able to do what we do without you guys. <laughs> and I don't think we can say that enough. So um, we appreciate you guys too. So um, for the good of the order, I just want to say, and I see your hand, Ms. Copeland Miller. Um, old, May is also Older American Month. And just so, you know, we keep our seniors in our minds and in our thoughts and the uh, the theme for Older American Month 2021 is community of strength. Older Americans have built resilient strength over their lives through success, failures, joys, and difficulties. So if we also keep that in mind, it is uh, Community Action Month, but it is also Older American Month to appreciate those who have paved the way for us uh, to get where we are. And that's something the Housing Authority does every year. Even though COVID's putting some restraints on us, we won't have our big barbecue in partnership with the county this year. 
uh, that we typically have, but we are still recognizing all of our seniors uh, for the month of May. Uh, Ms. Copeland-Miller. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hill, for that. And thank you guys for recognizing us. I appreciate this over the American month. That's good to know. For the good of the order, I wanted to say that they're going to be having, I was attending the East Hampton Citizen Advisory um, Committee, which I'm on their board, and Representative Diane Hart came on to ask that we listen. She'll have her radio show on Saturday on WTMP at 8 o'clock, where they have, the state legislator has um, identified a pot of money for low-income residents in the East Tampa area, and it may be some helpful information um, that social services may be able to use. I know that they did bring up the fact that the city and the county with social services are very involved with the housing and utility. They talked about the CARES Act. So if you all would, and you have the opportunity to tune in to WPMP, 8 o'clock, Saturday morning to Representative Hart's radio show so she can bring some information from Tallahassee. Thank you. Madam Chair, also okay. of the order, uh, it is also the Asian uh, American and Pacific Islander. Uh, oh, right. And as a matter of fact, the uh, the uh, the Realtor uh, Association, the Asian um, Executive Realtors at uh, Greater Tampa Realtors, I'm working with them on the programming, as well as uh, they have what's called the ABC Day, which is Asian uh, goodness. But it's uh, it's a community outreach that they do, and actually they're looking at doing it with Tampa Housing Authority in terms of doing a collection and uh, passing it on to Tampa Housing Authority for um, for senior mothers. So it's kind, okay. of, kind of combine the two. So just letting you know a heads up on that. Good. As long as it does not come to my desk, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, about that. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have anyone else to go to the order? If not, um, look for the little hands, the little hands. Okay, it is 1.39 p.m. And um, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for your support and your participation. Thank Bye. you.